Unbound Book Festival. My name is Alex George and I'm the director of the festival. And this event is called Times Like These, A User's Guide. Some of you watching this evening may have been in the audience at the Missouri Theatre in April of 2019 when the keynote speaker was George Saunders. I'm presently reading George's newest book, which I highly recommend, and I wanted to share with you this little bit from the introduction. Saunders writes, over the last 10 years, I've had a chance to give readings and talks all over the world and meet thousands of dedicated readers. Their passion for literature, evident in their questions from the floor, our talks at the signing table, the conversations I've had with book clubs, has convinced me that there's a vast underground network for goodness at work in the world a web of people who've put reading at the center of their lives because they know from experience that reading makes them more expansive, generous people and makes their lives more interesting. Now, if there has been a better explanation as to why we put on this festival every year, I am yet to hear it. Yes, we have all put reading at the center of our lives. And yes, it makes our lives more interesting. All of which is to say, welcome, welcome to Unbound and welcome to this little part of an underground goodness, uh, underground for goodness at work in the world. As you know, the festival has always been completely free to attend, whether in person or online. And this wouldn't be possible without the generosity of hundreds and hundreds of people who have supported us financially over the years. If you go to the website, unboundbookfestival.com, you'll see a list of everyone who has given over the past two years. It's a very long list and we are very grateful. Also on the website, you will see a donate button if you'd like to make a donation of your own. We're a registered nonprofit, so gifts are tax deductible and we are completely run by volunteers. So everything that we receive goes directly into putting on these events. Big or small, it all helps. Thank you. Support comes too from the City of Columbia, specifically the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. We're also grateful to the Boone Electric Cooperative Foundation and the Assistance League of Mid-Missouri for their support. Particular thanks this evening goes to tonight's sponsor, Restoration Eye Care. We're very grateful to them for their continued sponsorship of the festival for the past several years. And unless you're listening to an audiobook, you kind of need your eyes working well to read. So this always felt like a great partnership. And we're very happy to have them back on board again this year. Unbound is all about audience interaction. And just because we're not in the same room, that doesn't mean that that shouldn't continue. So please feel free to post questions for the panelists in the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of the session. Uh, and if you need a little encouragement to participate, we will be giving away a copy of Catherine's book and of Marley's book uh, to one randomly selected audience member. Please remember that if you miss an event, everything is available for viewing or reviewing on both our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, please do take a moment to review the whole schedule, all three months of it, on the website and plan to attend as many events as you like. And while you're there, please consider signing up for our newsletter, which goes out every Monday and will keep you up to date with what to expect each week. Uh, as some of you might know, I've already interviewed Catherine May wearing my Skylark Bookshop hat. And so to spare her the tedium of having to talk to me again, uh, we thought it would be interesting to change things up a little bit. And so I'm very pleased to welcome this evening's moderator, Dr. Alexandra Socarides. Alex is the author of two critically acclaimed books of criticism uh, and scholarship, and was until recently the chair of the English department of the University of Missouri. And she's now the Associate Provost for Faculty Success at MU. Alex, welcome to Unbound. Thank you. All right, so we have a slight issue here, um, uh, which things haven't gone quite according to plan. Um, Catherine May, as some of you may know, is English and she lives in England, which means that right now it's four minutes past one in the morning. And we uh, had hoped uh, <laughs> she was going to set her alarm, um, but we haven't seen her yet. So we're going to keep our eye out. But in the meantime, Alex, you're going to be speaking with Marley uh, and we'll just carry on on, on on that basis. So I will um, uh, keep an eye out for her too. And uh, I'll swing back at the end to wrap things up. Otherwise, I'll leave it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, 
thank you to Alex George, to the programming committee of the Unbound Book Festival, and to all of the volunteers who make these events possible. I'm very pleased to be here tonight to facilitate this conversation between, we hope, if Catherine shows up, two extraordinary writers and between you, our audience, and these writers. As Alex said, you can put questions in the chat and, um, and I will come to them at about uh, 7.40 this evening. In a moment, I will introduce them. Um, but first, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure for me to spend the last few weeks with these two books. Um, they're both stories of personal journeys, at times done very differently, but with a similar commitment to revealing the author as someone who is in process and to doing this with the utmost grace and generosity to themselves, to their readers, um, and to the world that we all live in. This evening, you'll get a taste of what those journeys were like and to meet the women who shared these stories with us. So I will hold off on introducing Catherine until she arrives in the hopes that she will arrive. And I will begin by introducing Marley. Marley Grace is a dancer and writer whose work focuses on the self, devotion, ritual, creativity, and art making. Her practice is rooted in improvisation as a conceptual form that takes shape in movement videos, books, quilting, online courses, and hosting artists. Marley's Instagram dance project, Personal Practice, has been featured in the New York Times, Dance Magazine, Vanity Fair, The Huffington Post, and more. And she is here this evening to discuss her newest book, which is called Getting to Center, Pathways to Finding Yourself Within the Great Unknown. So welcome to Marley. Here we are. <laughs> Just me and you, Alex. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Okay, be so great. before we, before I start asking you questions mm -hmm. and we'll hope that Catherine's face will pop in at some point and she will yeah, answer questions as well. Um, I just wanted to hand it over to you to say anything else you want to say by way of introduction to your book and then to give us a few minutes of reading so that the audience Great. can get a taste of the book. I love it. I'm just, uh, I'm so happy to be here. It feels so 2020 into 2021 for us to be like, Catherine, where are you? I've been lucky enough to get to hang with Catherine twice in the last few months. I got to interview her and then she interviewed me on her podcast. So I was already feeling like, I'm so lucky, three for three. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just have to sleep. I don't know, you know, it just, it kind of feels so like both Catherine and I's books, honestly. It's like, it's, it's we're kind of wintering our way to center on this one tonight, so. Um, yeah, I would love to read if that sounds like the next, the next move. Um, I also feel, I'll just make one more joke, opening joke. Like it does feel kind of fun to whoever's here. Like I feel like we tricked them a little bit. We were like, come see New York Times bestselling author, Catherine May. And then you're stuck with like scrappy number three indie bestseller at some bookstores, Marley Grace. <laughs> but I promise I'm gonna just, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, I'm on social media sabbatical, which actually when Catherine interviewed me, it, in her beautiful, like, so interesting to see how our language is just a little bit different. And she used the word holiday. And I was like, oh my God, it's a holiday. Like, this is not a sabbatical. This is a, this is a holiday from Instagram. So I deactivated. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about faith because it's actually really scary to deactivate when your career more or less depends on it. Um, but my mental health wasn't really going well. So I've been thinking a lot about faith. It's the last chapter in Getting to Center. And I'll just read a few pages. So what if you are completely tapped out of faith? There's nothing left. Everything has proven there is no center and you can't get back and you'll never get back. And there's absolutely no way to find yourself and your joy or contentment ever again. Welcome, you made it where so many of us have gone separately and together and you aren't alone. If all you manage to muster is the deep knowledge that you are not the only one who has ever felt what you feel, then you will win. You will be okay. 
It might take a while if you've spun all the way outside the lines, but faith is about building the helper team back up, back to the point where you can grab a line and a thread that can pull you back. In my own path of healing, remembering getting to my center, as soon as I have decided that I'm the only one who has ever fucked up, felt pain, experienced grief, unmanageability, I'm in trouble. I have put a fence between me and the universe, and instead of building a little door to walk through, I now have to either run really fast to hop over the fence or dig myself a hole to go underneath. So I see what I can do to restore the faith in the name of loneliness, in the name of isolation, abandonment, and come back to myself. Have faith in this. Have faith in the holding, in your own becoming, and knowing that in utter despair comes more holding. You know that poem, story, laminated wallet card, footsteps or footprints? A man always sees his and Jesus's footprints in the sand and Jesus tells him, I'll always be with you. But when the man is super sad and having a hard time, he is angry at Jesus. Only my footsteps are there, how could you? And Jesus is like, no, no, I was carrying your sad ass barefoot self through the sand because you were so sad. Basically, Jesus is like, I got you, bro. It's like that. Faith is like the footprints laminated wallet card. It is your chance to lean into the divine mystery, the holy trinity that you invent. You can invent whatever you want. Magic is whatever you want it to be, whatever you desire. Magic is rocks and sticks and an altar of knickknacks you decide are important or not important, and you pray to them, and you ask for help, and you carry on. Another reminder to me that when I am spinning out into the darkness is the prayer of St. Francis, patron saint of animals and the environment. As far away from my center as I can possibly go, being of service to others and integrating selfless, unconditional love can be the faith that serves and saves me. The prayer is, God, divine spirit, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Grant that I seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. Theologian, comedian, and mover Riot Mueller taught me that at the end of St. Francis's life, he had this robe that was tattered and covered in patches. And when his students offered to get him a new robe, he said, no. I want my insides to match my outsides. May your whole life be a quilt of faith, filled with imperfections and patched holes. May you delight in the ways that the patchwork of your life has sharp and curved angles, embroidered edges, and mismatched patterns. May it be unique and worn in, and may it be a light to all who desire their own imperfectly perfect quilt of a life. Accepting that you are loved and worthy just as you are, just as you are becoming. That is how we get to center. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful yeah. reading. Thanks. So um, you kind of lead really beautifully into my first question because you ended with that word center. And in fact, maybe you can, because you've interviewed with Catherine so much, you can answer this maybe from her perspective too. I was going to ask you both about the fact that your books really focus on a single word. So hers being mm -hmm. winter and yours being center. And um, like you focus on, you use, you challenge, you remake this word for your own purposes. And my sense was in reading both of the books that kind of holding close to that word was important to both of the books. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how it came that you really decided to like keep returning to this word center, um, how it helped or how it hindered you as you were writing, what advice you have for other writers if they feel like they've 
they've got a word and they want to really dig into it where it can get you in trouble, where it can help, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I kind of consider myself anti-balance, like I'm anti the balance lifestyle. I think that's sort of like a really big in our self-help world is like, we just, you know, work-life balance, family mm -hmm. balance, like balance is just thrown around so much. And I'm such a, you know, a book that really changed me was When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. And, you know, so much of her writing is about groundlessness. And I think just that idea of like, I can have grounding practices, I can be as grounded as I want, but I actually have so little control of, of what happens in the world and in my life, that really being prepared for the ground to, to like, um, you know, disappear from under me is actually a better practice without being like um, a hypochondriac or worried that <laughs> something bad's going to happen. But just, um, yeah. And I think I'm, I'm someone who sort of like swings on a pendulum a little bit in, in my, in my writing and in my art making, I, I like do a lot at once. And then I have a, a long rest period. And so that was sort of, to me, I was like, I don't really like thinking about balance as much as um, thinking about like coming back to um, coming back to my center. And so that was in this book, it was it was really, you know, this is the longest thing I've ever written. It was like sort of nice as a writer who hadn't written in such long form to sort of be like, cool, I have this like theme I can keep coming back to. And yeah, there's definitely parts where I'm reading it and I'm like, I don't ever want to look at the word center again. So maybe that's um, part of it. But I'm working on a new piece of writing right now that's about our attention, specifically like as artists and writers. And so I'm getting trapped a little bit now with the word attention. And I just before this was like, I need to like Google some attention synonyms so I don't get trapped. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I will not, I will not pretend I'm also Catherine in this interview, but <laughs> I do love that like, yeah, wintering takes on like so many meanings throughout. Um, you know, it's like the inner and the outer wintering, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is sort of part of my like, part of centering to me is like the inner center, like what is Marley's inner landscape and and how do my outside projects and commitments also stay centered. It's sort of like the inner and outer meeting each other. So that's great. That's great. I mean, you kind of answered the winter end question too, in a way that, I mean, I imagine that this question could bring the two of you together in many ways in terms of your process um, and the way you, that you thought about um, those words. So um, I also wanted to ask a question about you, you kept talking in that last answer about kind of centering yourself, right, or finding the center for yourself. Um, both of the books are really clearly about very specific and particular experiences of individual, mm -hmm. of you two individuals, right? So for Catherine, the experience of kind of leaning into winter, and all that comes with it. And for you, the experience of finding that place that you can call um, your center, and yet the stories told also kind of transcend your own individual experiences. So at one point you write in your book, to me, getting to your own centers gives us more clarity in how to decenter ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think that both books really pull off this amazing feat, which is that you write books that are intensely about you, but you also decenter yourself. So, my question is, you know, how does one do this in a book that's often so kind of nakedly and vulnerably about the self? Um, you know, did you think a lot about the place that you inhabited there or how much space you took up in the writing? How did you how did you kind of put yourself there and take yourself out at the same time? I realize that's a complicated question. I love it. I love your questions, <laughs> Alex. Um you know, I think I think a lot about um, like the intersecting identities of being both like the oppressed and the oppressor, like being a 
being a woman, being a lesbian, but also being cisgender and being white. And so where are there places where I'm like, let's take up some space? And where are there other places where I'm like, maybe it's time for Marley to step back? Um, and it's so related to my dance practice. Like when I'm making ensemble improvised work with other dancers, and you're like thinking about if you're gonna go into the dance or not, like one of my teachers, my my teachers are these women called, called the architects and one of their kind of prompts is like, is it more generous to go in or is it more generous to stay on the outside? And so yeah. I think that's something I ask myself a lot when I'm writing. I also like, for me, I'm not much of a like opinion or advice giver. I think I, I think I am, I have an advice radio show every Sunday, so let me pause to to not act like I don't like to give advice. But um, I I just write so specifically from my experience. I'm like, this is what I've, this is my lived experience. This is what I know. This is what I found out along the way. If you don't like it, I hope you find something you really like, and it helps you, you know, get there. And so, yeah, I think as I was writing the book, and as I'm always writing i'm i'm trying to sort of hold the nuance of like there's no way my experience is going to apply to everyone so where does it make sense to be specific and where does it make sense to like be a little more vague in service to not everyone is going to have the same relationship to these topics or not everyone has access to the same things i've had or et cetera. Et cetera. so I think that might answer your question. Yeah, I love the um, I love the answer about dance. I never could have mm -hmm. anticipated that the kind of invitation to the center, but then the, also the invitation to stay outside of the circle yeah. or outside of the center of the circle. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, I mean, I guess that leads into my next question, which is kind of about your readers um, and your relationship to your readers. You know, how much did you imagine? readers of this book as you were writing them? Who were those readers? Um, do you have any advice for, to writers of personal narratives about how to think about audience in a way that will allow them to say what needs to be said, but not be too um, kind of hamstrung by their by an imaginative reader? Mm. I love, I'm like, I, it's so interesting. I so appreciate both you and our other Alex's intros of like, I feel like such an author. Like I so often feel like I accident, I, I, I identify as an accidental self-help author. Like I didn't really set out to be like, I'm a writer. Like it really feels like such an extension of my dance practice and my quilting practice, like these other things. So I'm a little bit humbled to be like, I don't know if I thought of anyone while I wrote this book, like, which is sort of, um, I mean, you know, I've been writing and have had sort of this career as myself and a, a host, an artist host and a shop owner since 2012. So, you know, I, I think like there's a natural, like I sort of in some ways already know who my audience is because they're interacting with me online. And, um, but I think I really write without them in mind in, in a nice way. Like I think if I thought about them too much, I'd probably just stop and, and would get really concerned and worried about what they would think of the book. And I, I think some of it is like trusting the practice of, I've released enough things into the world publicly at this po point that I know that when I just share my experience, people seem to be really touched by that and really changed and really like inspired to get to know themselves more. So I think that's generally my hope. I definitely have hopes when I'm writing. Um, like I hope people, yeah, this book felt like it was a little bit more for me. The 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 next book I'm working on, I'm excited to be thinking about this quite more because it feels more like my next project is a lot more of like what do the people need and how can I like really serve them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, so. 
you know, both you and Catherine have a fair amount to say in your books about work. Um, probably you more than she does. She has this great kind of opening, a, a piece early in wintering where she talks about how kind of, um, you know, she was uh, um, teaching and the kind of load of grading papers and yeah. the, um, the labor of that kind of teaching. But um, you also talk a fair amount about work. So being excited by work, driven by work, kind of buried by work. I know you wrote an earlier book on work. Um, you know, uh, you both think about a kind of culture that makes people sick from overwork. Um, and so um, I loved the reflections on this mm. um, that both of you made. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about kind of some of your insights on this topic for the audience tonight. Um, I think, you know, your book performs a kind of retreat from work, a kind of practice of resting a little bit more. Um, but kind of how did you come to realize you had things to say about cultures of work? Yeah, I, I'm like, how? Oh. I, yeah, I'm staring at a pile of how to not always be working next to me, the book that I wrote about working too much. Um, I mean, it really all was born from, I mean, to be honest, just kind of like being a millennial who started their business using social media, like all of a sudden, the glorification of like, share everything, share your personal life, share who you're dating, share your dog, share your cat. Um, like the the like we're gonna share our behind the scenes as part of the brand be just became what like everyone was doing and this kind of like really full circle leads us to like me today being like i have to deactivate social media for months because i'm so like haunted by the energy of it right now and yeah you know the big um i was i am a knitter as a hobby and um i made a large investment <laughs> in yarn for the store that i had and it did very poorly because no one needed another yarn no one needed yarn in my store and i was like this is a hobby i should turn this is just it's just all part of the business and it was just like a bad business move i all of a sudden had no hobbies i just it was truly the turning point of like everything was work. Um, and I'm still like, I joke, someone was interviewing me recently and they read part of how to not always be working to me in the interview. And I literally didn't know what they were reading. And I was like, that was really good. Like, what was that? And they were like, that is literally from the book you wrote. And I was like, mm, can't, don't remember that time that I wrote, you know, it's like, it's really, which part of it is my practice of writing is like very channeled. I feel very like I am just a vessel for great, whatever assignment spirit has for me today. So um, yeah, I'm like, definitely still learning. Like I'm still learning what I'm writing about and sharing with people. And I try to be very um, transparent to people who buy my books. Like I'm in this process I, I believe you said it in the intro, like I am in process and I always will be. And yeah, I don't feel like, um, yeah, I don't have, you know, any like deeply researched thoughts on like work and class and the history of work in America or the world per se, but I know that um, access to the internet, you know, I also like started being my own boss shortly after I got sober almost 10 years ago. And it was just sort of like replacement addiction was like, well, if I'm not going to drink, I'll just um, be obsessed with working. And so, yeah, I can say to those who are wondering, it gets easier. You'll get, um, it gets, it gets easier. Log off, log offline and it'll feel easier. That's my thought. That's my advice. <laughs> I think it's, you know, I said before that I think it's a really great part of the book. Um, and I do because often you don't expect um, in a book called Getting to Center that someone's going to admit, you know, feeling addicted to social media or feel that, you know, there's that great part in the book where you say that you, um, 
I think it's when you went to Colorado, right? And you were like, I don't know how to go and not work there yes. for a week. And then you tried it. And, you know, those are kind of admissions that, um, that people don't often make because they think it's not a big deal. Um, but you kind of make that visible. That's yeah, great. I like to I like to talk about things that feel really uncool to me because I started talking about being addicted to social media in like 2018 and it was extremely uncool then. It was like we it was like Fight Club. It's like the one rule of Fight Club is we don't talk about it. It's like we don't we don't log on to Instagram and say hard to log off of here. Like that makes you look weird. And I was like, no, I have somebody needs to discuss this. Um, yeah, I'm laughing because we have the private chat and our, our dear friend Hallam is telling us like what the questions are, but I was, it wasn't registering to me and it's like, Ooh, knitting, what's your favorite project? I'm like, Oh my God, Hallam knits. <laughs> but I'm realizing he's reporting the questions to us, but that's okay. <laughs> and I'll go to those questions in a minute. The Great, I'm gonna ignore them. Yeah, yeah, you can ignore them for Sorry. now. It's mul it's multitasking. <laughs> I know it's it's too much, too much, too yes. much work. Yes. I know it. Okay, I won't look. Um, okay I'll, I'm gonna ask you two more questions, and then we'll go to okay. the audience because I Great. know they have questions. So, um, so I guess work to vulnerability. I have a question about mm -hmm. vulnerability, which is yeah, just. Um, you know, you you make yourself very vulnerable in this book, um, mm -hmm. but you know, we also know for those of us who've read your book that you're very honest about the fact that vulnerability itself can be a performance. Um, and I think you write about that really well. Um, so, um, where would you say the true vulnerability of your book resides? You know, what kind of wisdom can you offer about writing vulnerability? Are there writers who kind of who do that well, who you admire, who you say, that's not a performance of vulnerability, but that is vulnerability itself. Like, how do you know the difference? I think I heard, I don't know if she came up with this sentence or was repeating it, but I, I heard Glennon Doyle in an interview once, say something once like, you write from the scar, not from the wound. And I really think about that a lot. Um, and I think that sometimes when people are like, wow, you're so vulnerable, I can get a little bristly because in my head, I'm like, you have no idea what wounds are still open over here. That, you know, to me, it's like I am writing sort of from, I mean, honestly, I feel like when I write about social media, it's the most vulnerable to me because it's like writing about sobriety it feels really easy to me because it's like I just... Um, I'm not still actively struggling in the addiction with uh, alcohol. Um, I struggle in my sobriety sometimes, but I'm not like still trying to manage that. And I think that's where like, yeah, vulnerability comes for me in the, there are so definitely parts of the book where I'm like, that feels embarrassing a little bit to look at. Like, that's my clue when I'm being vulnerable. Like when I talk about my divorce or coming out or just other things that are feel so complete now. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's when I, like a lot of times if I'm talking to someone who's like going through a divorce or recently divorced and they're in so much fear about talking about it publicly, I'm like, you never know, you might end up gay and move, in with your ex-husband and run an artist residency. Like there's just, the path is so, could be so crazy. Um, and if you would have asked me three years ago, I would have been like, it's hell and it's terrible. And it's very sad still. You know, I wasn't really, I wasn't writing about my divorce when I was going through a divorce. Uh, maybe a little, but not the way I do now. So I really think, um, and I love the question of like, how do you know? I, I kind of just don't think you do. I think it's like kind of up to your intuition. And there are people who I think are performing vulnerability who still help me. And I can also be like, this feels like a beautiful performance. And um, it, I have a dance degree. Like it can be hard for me also. To, like I am trained to perform in front of an audience, you know, like it can be hard for me to kind of reel it in 
and be asking myself like um what is the tr what is the like raw truth here and and is that is it is it time to share it yeah that's great that's great thank you i love that quote about the scar and the wound yeah also yeah. um <laughs> okay i'm gonna ask you one last question and if in if in fact Catherine is maybe here, they can pop right. her into the feed at any time. Um, I had just a kind of ending question about the pandemic um, in in light of this um, uh, this book. You know, obviously you wrote the book before the pandemic. I wonder how. Um, you know, and probably at a time where you couldn't have even imagined the kind of conditions of social isolation that we've felt for the last 10 months. Um, yeah. So uh, has the pandemic made you think differently about anything you wrote in this book? You know, it felt so strangely, I mean, mo yeah, most of the book was written by the time the pandemic started, but I had a little, I had a, a month or two of like, fine tuning a couple of things to be a little more sort of pandemic specific, but overall it was like a really beautiful gift that um, the title, the subtitle, the chapter layout, like everything was uh, fully formed pre pandemic. So it really was just kind of this beautiful thing to sort of just offer people who had, had been going through it this whole time. Um, so yeah, it felt, it felt really, on time and happy to see it keep making its way into the world. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to some audience questions here. Um, and I'm looking in the comments. Um, there's a question here about mythology and legends. Can Marley comment on how they create these beautiful works and what research lines influence their creative writing. Um, I noticed you include mythology and legends. Hmm. Do I? <laughs> like, what? I might. I'm. I'm like trying to think of. I mean, I think what I'm think. What comes up for me? This is not really addressing the mythologies or the legends but um i my writing feels really i just started watching the hilma off clint documentary last night and was very tired and stopped watching it but it was very good and i'm excited to keep watching it and i love um yeah i'm just thinking so much like i definitely read a lot i watch a lot of things i I'm certainly taking in, I, I'm looking at, um, whatever, my desk looks wild. Um, let me try to answer this succinctly. What am I trying to say? Hilma was a part of a group of four, with four other women that they were doing these weekly seances for a decade where they were channeling all of this information and what I like call assignments. And I always feel kind of funny because I'm not like much of a new age spiritual witch on the outside. I, I think I present just more of like a queer artist, but on the inside, I'm like my writing, I don't really have like a creative writing practice. I don't really have like, I have editors at my publishing house who make things make a little more sense. But for the most part, when I'm writing, I'm just humble hands on a keyboard, you know? I'm just sort of like, taking what's coming and 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 putting it out. So um, I've been, I just started reading um, this book called The Freedom Quilting Bee, which I'm really excited about. And um, yeah, just reading about uh, the quilts of the South and and mostly black women quilters like the quilters of Geese Bend. And, you know, my, my quilting practice and researching quilt history definitely influences my writing in a lot of ways too. Well, that's great. And you kind of answered two other questions which are in the chat in that, in that someone asked, what is, what are you, what else are you reading or recommending? Oh, so nice. um, there's a, there's a book right there. And then someone else asked, what's your favorite knitting project you've done? 
I was going to see if there was something around me. Um, I'm working on a really fun, like brightly colored blanket right now, which feels really good because I work in mostly like very muted tones. And then the other book I just started is White Feminism by Koa Beck. And I'm, I'm not like super deep into it yet, but it's very good. It's just sort of about how like white kind of girl boss influencer culture has destroyed <laughs> certain like movements and and not just destroyed, but like led them in a certain way that maybe we could, it's reminding me of the like, is it more generous to step in or step out? And like, when is it really needed to speak? And when is it maybe time to like do some internal dialogue? So yeah. Great, great. Um, I'm just seeing, I think they said one audience question, Alex, would you like to hop back in here? <laughs> well, it, I got an email saying that she was awake, um, but I and I've sent her the link, but she doesn't appear to have appeared. So um, it's one of the. Oh, oh, there's, oh, there's, 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 oh there's our girl. Sorry, I thought it was for uh, twenty-two. I was supposed to be coming. That was the time I had. Was that too late? Oh well, listen, it's um, uh, <laughs> it's all good. You know oh, what? I think maybe we there was a glitch with the um, because we're six hours behind, and maybe there maybe there was some in the transatlantic thing. There was oh. there was another another hour that got lost. Oh um, no! <laughs> you know oh, what? I it's all good. It's 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 all good. We we it's great to see you. Okay, you can take me off again now. I'm going to disappear and let you guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Hello. Hi. I'm Alex. Nice. And Hi, you know Alex. Marley. Um, so Marley and I have been talking for about the last 40 minutes, and I asked her <laughs> lots of questions that I was going to ask you as well. But really, Sorry. now that now that you're here, I'm just going to give a very brief intro to you and ask if you'll read a little bit from the book for the of audience, course. for people of who course. come to. Okay, so... Um, so while she's getting her pages, I'll let you all know that Catherine May is an author of fiction and memoir whose titles include Wintering, The Electricity of Every Living Thing, and The Whitstable High Tide Swimming Club. She is the I really editor go for of complex titles. I know, it's great. <laughs> she is the editor of The Best, Most Awful Job, an anthology of essays about motherhood. Her journalism and essays have appeared in a range of publications, including the New York Times, The Observer, Good Housekeeping, and, a and Eon. Previously, the program director for creative writing at Canterbury Christchurch University, Catherine has worked as a literary scout and a freelance editor for organizations, including Faber Academy and Audible, and currently runs her own online writing school. She lives in Whitstable in England, where it is, we should recognize now, 1.43 a.m. <laughs> um, and she's here to discuss her newest book, Wintering the Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I'm so sorry I'm late. I'm never late. For Don't, worry. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're fine. Um, <laughs> Would would you like to say anything else by way of introduction and to read a few pages for us? Yeah, certainly. So, um, well, where do I start? So Wintering is a book about the, the down periods of life, I suppose you'd say. Um, and, you know, it's kind of hit home this year because of the pandemic and all of that kind of thing. And I think you guys have had an interesting political situation going down, but, you know, <laughs> that we're not aware of at all. We're all obsessed with it. Um, and I guess what's really interesting is that now we're beginning to move towards spring, really, I hope. You know, we're beginning to see the first signs of that recovery of the year. And I think loads of people are feeling really disappointed that they are not feeling those, you know, that joy necessarily you know they're not feeling that bounce back and that recovery that they were maybe expecting to this year there was this sense that our um our world was supposed to be getting better this year you know we've all been saying roll on 2021 <laughs> and it's not come yet and i i think that's a really really important part of the wintering experience um 
these things just take their own time you know you can't rush them you can't expedite them um and i think that's one of the very vile and difficult aspects of the the thing that we go through um should we positively call it character building i don't know <laughs> um <laughs> that's that's definitely how loads of people put it over here um but you know in a funny sort of way it is but anyway i thought um I thought I might read a little bit um, from the chapter Hunger, um, which is a chapter sort of towards the end of the book. And it's about the wolvish feelings we have in these darkest moments. And I thought I'd like to I'd like to go there, really. I'd like to go there to how bad we're often feeling uh, because it's so easy to ignore. Do we have a go? I walk in the late January frost and I realise that I'm a wolf today. I'm overcome by the need to prowl, to go outside and stalk about my territory. There is an unrest in my gut that feels like hunger. I'm a seething mess of uncertainty, my mind so full of forked paths that I worry it could spill. I want to be everything, but I'm nothing. I'm an empty bowl, concave, an absence in space. I'm back to those blank days of early motherhood again, taking care of my child at home, trying to be good, trying to be abundant with love and righteousness. Goodwill is always scarce with me and I've run dry. I watched H go out to work this morning like all of life isn't turned upside down and I felt I could spit on his receding shadow. It's not his fault, I know that, but life is biting at me yet again and yet there's no one else to deflect the savagery. There's a postcard above my desk, an etching by William Blake of a little man who's propped a spindly ladder up against the moon. He's just mounted the bottom rung, a long, impossible climb ahead. A caption reads, I want, I want. I've always been that figure, reaching up towards impossible things. Today, I'm sick with those desires, trying to channel the infernal patience of parenthood while a dozen stories ball up in my throat, unable to be written. I'm scared that it might be forever, that one obstacle after another will prevent me from making the work I need to make in order to stay sane. And yet now, relieved of my schoolroom duties for the day, I find that the ball of ideas that's lodged itself in my gullet and will not emerge so that I cannot write them down. All I can do is walk. I have nothing else. The sun is low, making gold streaks in the desiccated grasses that line my route. I'm alert to birds, to the sudden bustle of movement in the bare red brambles. My mouth craves and I cannot tell what, would make me, what it would make me do if I didn't stalk. Never having been a smoker in my life, I want a cigarette just for the sense of occupation it would lend to my tongue and my lips, just for the feeling of transgression. Otherwise, I think it would be a drink at this time in the morning. My mouth wants it. It wants the disruption of a long, intense swallow and the days it might bring. I see why cigarettes are a lesser evil than those dark, disruptive moments when the mouth will use anything to avoid crying out its pain. Instead, I walk. I've learnt to walk at these moments. I've learnt to walk until the heat leaves. So, yeah, so I think that, like in lots of ways, expresses what many of us are feeling right now you know those very desperate times and I think it's so important we start to voice those as well as voicing the the you know the more simple emotions like sadness that may, maybe make us feel like slightly better people <laughs> that's great thank you very much for that reading um I know I mean, I have some questions for you and I know there are some questions in the chat, but I just I just noticed right away that someone asked how long it took you to um, write Wintering. And I wasn't gonna go to the audience questions right away, but it kind of comes on the heels of your comments about, you know, that we, ex the book takes place right from like September through mm. 
March. There's a sense that it's going to end and it's not. But in terms of the writing of this, um, over how many winters did you write it or did you not write it in winter? Or can you just tell us a little bit about the writing process of the book? <laughs> no, I did have to write it over winter and it got commissioned um, just at the end of one winter. And then summer landed and I found I couldn't write it. I just couldn't write it in the sun. It was a particularly hot summer as well. And oh, maybe it wasn't. It just it felt like that because I kept thinking I can't do this. Like this doesn't make any sense for me to, to write right now. And so um, I started again in the autumn, but then everything started going wrong as, as is documented in the book. Um, so actually it ended up being written very quickly probably in four months total, um, but a lot of it written in two, really. Uh, and I was, like the day before it got submitted, I was still rewriting chapters and rearranging stuff. Um, so it felt like a mad, crazy rush. And, and honestly, when I, um, when I submitted it, I thought, at least I've got something in and my editor can throw it back at me and tell me that it's terrible but at least she'll know that I tried <laughs> but she didn't it's, I don't know somehow I managed to pull it off I'm not sure how <laughs> thank you um well I asked Marley a bunch of questions which actually I'm going to kind of turn it to Marley because um she did such a great job of answering these questions about um, about vulnerability and about work and about her readers and stuff. And I'm wondering if there's something that I asked you, Marley, that you would kind of want to be in conversation with Catherine about, if you wondered what her answer would be, just to get you guys talking to each, to each other. I love it. We love to talk to each other. <laughs> we do, um, yeah. <laughs> I loved, you know, I loved the question about like, are you thinking about an audience when you're writing a book? And how much are you thinking of the reader, like being of service to the reader? I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Oh, that's so interesting, because I wish I'd been able to listen to you say that too. Um, I'll play back later. <laughs> um, what am I thinking? I think in lots of ways, for a long time when you're writing you have to put that aside because I think that can kind of haunt the inside of your head a little bit um and it can be quite inhibiting um I know I do have moments when I'm writing when I I can kind of think about every perspective that's going to come from what I've said and that can be quite intimidating in lots of ways but equally I did I did write this like I did think up this book as a kind of with service in mind like I I did you know, say to my agent, well, I, I want to write a book that you'd press into the hands of a good friend when you're having a moment of, cri mm -hmm. when they're having a moment of crisis and say, look, you know, here's something that might help. Um, but I, I found as I wrote, I almost had to kind of switch that off because mm -hmm. I needed to just start like really entering a very personal space, actually, like really going quite deep into the inside of my own head. Um, and then afterwards, when I read it back, when I finally got the chance, I thought, okay, well, I think that's maybe the use of the book because it takes you into those sort of granular moments of experience of a wintering. Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, like the bit I just read, actually, I think, I think it takes it to bits that we don't express that much and that we tend to shy away from and that we find in, embarrassing really and and shameful um and I that's you know like the keeping those bits in the book is part of my consideration for the audience in a way although there were bits that I did take out when on reflection and thought mm, not sure <laughs> only because like they maybe were more compromising for other people around me then you know maybe more critical of you know those those kind of people around me and stuff like that and I thought no I don't I don't think that's right but I did try and keep in the stuff that was about me and about my dirtier feelings I think mm -hmm. um, that's great that actually um kind of spurs me to ask a question that I had slashed from the list of things that I was going to ask you both but you 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 brought it up now 
which is um, about the other people in your books. So in some ways, these books are very much about you too um, and, and your very deep personal experiences, but there's also all these other characters, right? So I'm thinking, Catherine, about your child mm -hmm. and Marley about your partner, about your ex-husband, right? These people show up who are part of, you know, mm -hmm. a very personal in-process journey that you're on um, and how you navigated, um, you know, how much to bring them into that story and how much to leave them out. And obviously, Catherine, you just gestured at one problem, which is always, are you saying too much about people who didn't ask <laughs> to be put in a book? But yeah. um, I wonder what you both, you know, think about that question. Molly, you start. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I really only include things that I feel like more or less the other person would be comfortable with, or I'm so often like talking more about like themes. I will say with things I wrote about John and I's relationship, I didn't ask him. There's definitely some specifics, but we like, the Boston Globe interviewed us together once, but separately um, after we had like moved in together and in the friend phase of our relationship. And he shared things that I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so I was kind of like, it's probably fine. Um, but he, he has made a, a really good joke before where he's like, we call each other Hun. And he's like, Hun, I'm so glad you've like made a career off of our pain. <laughs> and I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm so sorry. And you're, I hope it brings us all a great abundance. And yeah, with Jackie, my current partner, you know, we, we talk more specifically as, as we are in partnership, like what feels we were talking about vulnerability earlier, Catherine, and like what feels like mm. it's still kind of a rawness we're in and what feels like some stuff we've kind of already closed up. And so, yeah, we're always in conversation about what feels comfortable for me to share in my books, on my radio show, et cetera, so. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a really full area actually. Um, like I, you know, I teach memoir writing as well. And I know it's the question that most of my students come up with. It's it's something that you don't really predict until you start writing. And then if you're tuned into it, you begin to think, oh my God, you know, what, what am I doing here? Um, I am really careful about what I share actually, particularly with my son. Um, he, you know, he's too young to really understand what it would mean to consent to much personal information being shared. So I was really, really careful about the bit about him in the book. Um, I I mean, I've always like included incidental details about our life together that I think are like cute or that are just, you know, everyday life. Um, but, you know, the book includes his crisis and I seriously question whether to include it. But I, when I did, I wrote it so that actually it's pretty anonymized about what he was really going through and why, and that it kind of focused on like still, like in many ways, still the more positive parts of our experience through that, you know, the kind of <sighs> discursive stuff, I guess. Um, and also, um, like, I don't know how this gets read in, in lots of ways, but I kind of made it about my experience of his crisis rather than his experience of his crisis. And I hope people don't read that as like me being an egomaniac who thinks it only happened to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> tempting to feel like that, actually, sometimes. Um, but, you know, actually, that's because I, I wanted to really kind of protect his privacy. Um, and now, like, he's eight now. Um, turning nine in May and I think I will you know probably not share anything about him for a long time now because I think he really is reaching the age when he's much more defensive of his privacy you know he's decided that he doesn't want photo, like goofy photos of him put up on Instagram like I've I, not on my Instagram like he's got his own private Instagram that gets yeah. shared with his gran um, and he's reached the age now where he's like, oh, I look stupid in that photo. I don't do that. you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think about it a lot. I mean, my husband obviously has to do a legal read of the book um, before it goes to press. That's always something that, you know, that comes up. He always has to consent. Um, but he doesn't tend to read the book until he absolutely has to. 
um, and thank goodness he trusts me. Um, but yeah, it's it's fraught, isn't it? I think it's fair to say it's a fraught issue that you know merits some concern, and not everybody is comfortable with being in a book, and you know you have to really respect that. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell the audience, since it's one minute to eight, that we're going to run a little bit over, probably for about 10 more minutes, if people want to stay and listen to another few questions. Um, there are some great questions in the, in the chat from the audience, so I'm going to go to those. Um, uh, one of them is about um, uh, your, your, your book, The Electricity of Every Living Thing, Catherine, um, where the, the writer here says that, um, that that book discusses disability more in depth than wintering. Um, and could mm. you comment on the process between those two books and mm. possibly on that topic? Sure. Uh, so The Electricity of Every Living Thing is my memoir of learning I was autistic age 38 um, and the kind of process by which I came to that like uh, revelation and it really did feel like a revelation at the time um, and it it kind of uh, so I, I it was a year that I decided to walk the southwest coast path which is this amazing craggy path that runs around the coast of Devon, Cornwall, Somerset and Dorset so the very far southwest of the UK um, and I decided to do that um, because I'd kind of I was just losing my mind uh, with a young child in the house and I, I felt like I was losing my identity and I decided to like do this thing for myself. And the process of walking meant that I just ticked everything over in my head and, and began to sort of re reimagine my story um, about what I was and what was going on for me. Yeah, it does. It, so what I try to, to portray in that book is the experience of being an autistic woman. Um, I say that specifically because um, like it's not it's not fixed, you know, there are autistic men that are like me, certainly, but um, we're beginning to have a sort of discussion about gender now in autism that is, that kind of, that, that feels, and I, I feel really strongly about this, like I've always felt quite non-binary, but I also feel like autism is like, part of my gender it's quite distinctive compared to neurotypical women um, so I'm always happy to call myself an autistic woman but like woman has always been challenging for me um, because I've always felt so different to that kind of mainstream femininity and that hit home particularly in motherhood anyway sorry so <laughs> that's kind of a diversion into like trying to say that uh, the book is about the kind of experiential aspects of it because it's quite difficult for loads of people to understand from the outside because it's very different to that traditional portrayal of what autism is um, and we don't often see portrayals of autism um, maybe without learning disability although you know that's a, a common part of the spectrum of experience um, and for me autistic women were invisible um, mm -hmm. and I couldn't recognize myself because I'd never seen myself anywhere so I felt alien um, and I kind of hope it's part of that. Um, the, the conversation between the two books on that, I mentioned that I'm autistic quite briefly in wintering. Um, and that was really, that was, that was quite considered actually, um, because I'd just written in depth about, about that experience and I didn't really want to repeat myself, I guess. But it is relevant to wintering. It is definitely the sort of defining experience that I draw on when I see myself as a as a sort of regular winterer um, mm. and that's what's so common across my community you know we burn out a lot we um, suffer from ill mental health a lot we suffer rejection and isolation and outsidership a lot um, so yeah I, I thought a lot about the balance of that I think is is you know the truth of it um, and I yeah it's wintering is informed by the pre, you know the previous book really um although they're very different you know electricity is is very much more of a pure memoir um mm -hmm. you know whereas wintering kind of takes a broader lens a wider lens that's great and i think that gives people who are listening and watching tonight a sense of um you know the relationship between those books mm. and how that that first book can inform if they've read wintering they might go back now and read electricity yeah. 
Um, yeah, so, it's never actually been you. released in the States, so it's a, it's oh. a transatlantic order, I'm afraid, but um, it's possible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and I, I wanted to end with this question, which actually Marley and I had just begun to scratch the surface of when you showed up, which is about the pandemic. Um, there's a question in the chat here about um, how have your experiences with wintering helped you get through the pandemic thus far? Has the past year given you any new thoughts or perspectives on the idea of wintering? Um, <laughs> How, you know, when you, wrote, when, you, when you wrote this, you did, I guess, one of the many definitions you could have put of wintering was a pandemic, but you didn't know that was on the horizon. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's been a really weird part of it, actually. <laughs> you know, people um, uh, talk, you know, talk about my book as like a, a book that is about the pandemic. Um, and it obviously, I could never have intended that. I wish I had that kind of foresight. I'd be... I'd be gambling. I mean, frankly, I'd be <laughs> betting money on the horses. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think what's been interesting about the pandemic for me is watching like almost everybody go into a wintering in one go in a way that means that mm. we can no longer ignore it as an experience. You know, we've had to externalise that, that experience of wintering. Um, but I think what's quite confounding about that is that it doesn't seem to lessen the isolation of a wintering interestingly like we don't feel community in it we're often feeling very alone in that experience and and very like unable to share what we're going through um often because we feel quite guilty about you know maybe not suffering enough like feeling bad even though other people have got it worse or we might feel frustrated in the other direction that, um, you know, that we are really at rock bottom and other people are moaning, you know, for what seems from the outside like very little. Um, and I, I still think we struggle with that empathy for wintering as a state of being that isn't a hierarchy, you know, um, and that isn't comparable and that takes us into that space however it's caused um but it's it's an it's a fascinating thing to watch as, along with all the other things mm. great thank you marley did you have final thoughts on this question of the pandemic and the way it i mean what a thing to have published these books right at this moment <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of like back to Catherine's, like I kind of thought spring was coming and then it's still the pandemic and we just found out like we have to like move again in oh, the pandemic. No, like it's just kind of no. like, and again, small potatoes versus mm -hmm. what other people, you know, but kind of that, yeah, I think our household is having some of the feeling of like letting ourselves feel the grief and the sadness mm -hmm. and the joy and the rest and like just kind of trying to pay attention to all of it and not mm. check out too much we i love my gray's anatomy though you know shout out to anybody that's just not getting anything done and is just watching all 17 seasons like i just want to honor <laughs> that person <laughs> out there <laughs> my last thought <laughs> Well, I might invite Alex George back on to the screen to wrap us up here. Well, I'm back. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation, um, Marley and Catherine. It's been, uh, I've been looking forward to this for so long and it's been, it's been such a joy to listen to you speak. So thank you all. Alex, thank you for doing such a wonderful job. Um, and our thanks also to this evening's sponsor, uh, again, Restoration Eye Care. And just briefly, a um, couple of things. I wonder, first of all, um, whoever Steel City OG11 is, uh, you uh, won the prize. So we're going to send you a copy of uh, Marley's book and of Catherine's book. So if you would please send your uh, your uh, uh, send an email to mail at unboundbookfestival.com with your contact information, we will get those off to you and you are in for an absolute treat. Uh, next Tuesday is a big night for us. It's the celebration of the Unbound Book Festival 
Emerging Poet Award. This is something that we uh, instigated last year at the behest of an extremely generous individual who wished to recognize, celebrate, and support an upcoming poet. Um, since last year's festival was canceled, though, we're, we're bringing back last year's winner and this year's winner, so you get two for the price of one. Um, uh, and so we're going to be hearing from both of them. Uh, Sojourner Ahibi uh, won last year, and this year, uh, this year it's Lupita Eid Tucker, and you will be in for a real treat then. And then on Thursday, uh, we present a panel called Poetry and Prayer, um, and that features Unbound alum Molly McCulley Brown, uh, Alicia Jo Rabin, and Pulitzer Prize winning poet Jericho Brown. Uh, it's going to be an unmissable event. So thank you all for watching. Catherine, Molly, Alex, thank you again for a wonderful night, and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex and Alex. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Bye.